Cool, cool. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, it's my honor to introduce the final group of presenters here. The name of this session is Place and Space, which is a pretty broad description for anything, um, but it would take a broad description to encompass all of the exciting and diverse projects here. Um, uh, I'm excited about these projects, but also just like at a different level, excited to see all of these students who I've um, had the pleasure of teaching um, at least once each, and in many cases, several times each, um, wrap up their um, bachelor's careers here like this. So we'll start off with uh, Sam Algus, and Sam will be presenting Back Porches in Chicago. Um, just as usual, uh, we have 15 minutes. The idea is 10 minutes for your presentation and five for a Q&A. Uh, I'll send you a chat when five minutes of your 10 minute presentation part is up. Um, so keep, you know, half an eye on the on the chat. Um, but uh, yeah, over to you, Sam. Cool, thank you, Evan. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. It's good to see everybody. Actually, I'm gonna, hold on, I'm gonna close my window. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna get my own timer started too. So I'm Sam, um, I'm going to be, telling some stories about back porches. Um, why stories? Um, a couple reasons. Uh, because back porches aren't, they aren't one thing. Um, well, first of all, because stories are really um, all there is on back porches, um, whether it's poems or, or films or newspaper articles or, um, things that have happened to me over the past um, 21 years. Um, and then, yeah, because the other reason is because back porches aren't one thing. And so I thought, um, you know, on the scale, on the scale of their architectural form, on the scale of their, their urban context, uh, in the way that they're, they're used by people, and then uh, what they end up meaning to people and meaning to Chicagoans, they're not at all one thing. And so I thought to try to, um, define or abstract, you know, what is what is the back porch uh, would be to kind of totalize it uh, unfairly. Um, and so instead, uh, I thought the only way to really frame this project was was as telling a bunch of stories about back porches, um, where the sort of from the bottom up where the smallest scale um, of understanding of, of, of this sort of material reality and culture really uh, sort of each small scale uh, nests within larger ones and sort of informs an understanding of the next. And so in sort of um, starting uh, to try to convey the back porch uh, spatially and materially, uh, I thought the same, um, the same sort of hierarchy uh, was, was um, important uh, to sort of start with the small uh, here at the smallest scale of the material uh, and with particularities really. Uh, because all of these stories are really are just subjective and particular sort of takes on on particular back porches, and so I sort of did the same uh, in my in my illustration of them. This is this is my neighbor's back porch. Uh, these are graphite rubbings. So on the smallest scale, sort of uh, these are the literal pages that were that were held up against this actual object, right, and and rubbed with graphite to imprint its actual material and and textural qualities. Uh, so, so as some examples, these are some, some stairs, sorry, uh, some railings, uh, common brick and, and glass block, some decking, uh, hardware angle brackets, and then, you know, things that are, that are particular to my neighbor's porch, like, like their, um, their rubber doormat and their cricket downspout. Um, on the next scale, sort of informed by the previous of, of the material, you have the sort of elements of that, that constitute the back porch, really the, the things that we can point to or name that sort of create this, uh, this environment. Uh, again, here, sort of my neighbor's back porch, sort of now telescoping out on, on, on multiple levels. Um, you have 
um, the busted chair, and and these are these are common across across porches across Chicago. Things like the busted chair, the telephone wire, um, string lights, uh, the kitchen window is a really important element. Um, staircases, lights, benches, stuff like that. On the next scale, I use architectural drawings to sort of uh, illustrate the spaces um, that these you know materials and elements together nested sort of create. This first one is a, is a three flat um, in Humboldt Park or Hermosa kind of um, sort of showing the, the sort of front to backness of Chicago lots. This is a six flat in uh, South Shore. Um, I, I never went inside, but um, six flats tend to be split down the middle. So I put a little question mark. Um, and this one is, is my neighbor's back porch. Um, so again, telescoping out further, this is this is what it looks like um, in an architectural drawing. This one is my mom's back porch uh, section drawing. So cut through the actual sort of floorboards and the joists of the back porch, just sort of show more of the construction. But also I like this one because of how sort of neighbors are stacked and you know they make the space their own. These are uh, our neighbors, infamous Crocs. Um, and then the next scale is the scale of the landscape that back porches sort of create and, and inhabit themselves. Uh, so these are just sketches I've, I've done sort of over the past year, really. Um, this is Pilsen, sort of a back porch on the edge of a block. Um, this is the view of my neighbor's porch uh, across, out across the alley. Um, it's, uh, it's a sort of, it's a regular view with a lot of, you know, Chicago blocks are long and they have alleys going down the middle. So the, the sort of view across the alley to, to your, your alley neighbors is a, is a common one. Um, and this is, this is ours. This one is in Hyde Park, uh, a, a, really, um, a really cool example of uh, back porches really sort of defining this alley environment um, surrounding it. Um, there's toys everywhere, it's really great. Uh, this one is, is, is an example of um, an alley that sort of comes to a T and sometimes it, they make I's or, or H's, I guess. Um, and so the alley junction often becomes a sort of a less extreme version of that sort of enclosure uh, surrounding by back porches. It becomes kind of this uh, um, a bowl kind of thing. Um, so yeah, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna get into the the, the other stories, other people's stories, I guess. Uh, mostly, um, I'm gonna gloss over a lot of these all of these um because i've i've squeezed too much and i don't have much time left so i'm just going to sort of go over what um what each sort of chapter of my my paper um the stories the themes that they that they talk about the first one is about the origins of the back porch um which tend to be more mythical than uh, factual because um and not not in that the myths are are false but that they're sort of legendary it's like chicago folklore it's um it's uh it's legendary, yeah. So the Chicago Fire being that first legend. Uh, afterwards, every apartment was required to have two means of egress, and so Chicago used uh, wood, uh, which was the reason for the fire for their fire escapes because it was cheap. And the other legend is is that of the alley system, um, which Chicago, you know, Chicago is a city of alleys. Really, um, it was conceived right at the beginning in in 1830 as a system of of mass produced service and access. So. Uh, at the beginning, that was uh, that was horse manure. There were so many horses in the, in the city. Uh, what are we going to do with all their manure? We'll make alleys, uh, and so that's sort of the predecessors of, of garbage crews, of um, recycling trucks, right? But also gar uh, garages and telephone wires, right? As the sort of dendrites of this sort of infrastructural um, system, where back porches are kind of the endpoints, right? The sort of links to the home. And so that's actually where uh, people used to have their uh, groceries delivered and their milk delivered and their ice delivered. Um, and solicitors were, were uh, required to use the backs, uh, actually leaving um, some remnants on a lot of back porches in the city, sorry. Um, ice boxes that would open from the back porch and from the kitchen uh, as a convenience for, for ice men and for the homemakers. Um, so yeah, the next the next chapter is, is about um, how that sort of alley system over time, like that utilitarian sort of designation has become sort of obscured and, and more 
uh, becomes more ambiguous and, and they really become a landscape of their own. I, I call it in my paper, the alleyscape because it's really distinct from the streetscape uh, and the cityscape and, and I don't know, you can go on. Um, but it becomes this, this other place really um, characterized by, by its original utilitarian purpose and, and material reality like beautiful common bricks, but also, um, you know, characterized by, by freedom and, and uh, but also chaos and sort of wonder, you know, the wonder and fear that is a sort of, uh, that make the alley a sort of microcosm of, of sort of urban experience, right? And so there's a lot of funny stories there. Um, I'm, I'm glossing over. Um, the third chapter is about the back porch itself as a sort of threshold between that alley landscape and the domestic. So the way uh, Chicago apartments are typically laid out, you have the parlor or, or living room or Chicagoans will call it a front room or a French room um, and the kitchen in the back. And so um, the porch really becomes this mediator between this infrastructural landscape, right? And, and the, the kitchen and, and the homemakers sort of domain. And so you get uh, a lot of stories about frequent relationships between the housewife and the ice man or the solicitor or stuff like that. Uh, but but also uh, it's it's really a threshold um, between that sort of freedom and between the sort of the domestic and and often maternal uh, realm of of the home. And so there's um, you know a lot of kids in Chicago um, grew up playing and and learning the city through the alleys. This is this is a film called Medium Cool. Uh, uh, I really recommend it if you haven't seen it. One of the best Chicago movies. And there's a couple of sequences that really depict that threshold. And I love it because, you know, it's kitchen windows framing back porches and back porches framing kitchen windows uh, kind of as this uh, really permeable threshold. These scenes are amazing inside here. You can, you can hear the kids playing and, and the screen door is always, the door is always open. Um, there's more stories, poetry, um, Harry Monroe. Um, this boy wrote a, wrote a letter to the, editor of the Tribune because he wanted to be the first one to see the, the first the first Robin of, of spring. So the back porch becomes this this uh, you know uh, perspective, this this intimate sort of viewpoint of seeing sort of these infrastructural rhythms of the city, but also sort of, of nature of, of the cottonwoods and the, the trees of heaven right in the alley and um, and sort of just the workings of the city and sort of um, you know the changes of of the world really. Um, Fourth chapter, I, I hate glossing over this one. This one is about making do. It's about the acts of dwelling on, uh, in general in sort of our unprescribed living spaces. Um, and it's really about Gwendolyn Brooks who was known, uh, she's obviously a Chicagoan. She was known uh, from the age of seven or something for uh, writing and reading and, um, and, and dreaming on the back porch. Uh, and so her, her park um, in Bronzeville on, on 40, 46 and something greenlit, I think, there's a, there's a back porch behind her. And it's, it's not a threshold. It's this sort of stark, unprescribed, like vacant space. And so um, in this chapter, I really think about, you know, what is it about the back porch space, this sort of emptiness, this, um, this thing that, that sort of encourages dwelling and encourages making do. And, and I throw in some, some French philosophers and talk about, um, you know, how uh, dwelling is this inherently creative act. It's an act of creative agency, right? It's, um, and, and Gwendolyn Brooks is a really good example of that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm gonna gloss over stuff. Uh, just more stories about sort of these tactical acts of, of, um, of making space your own. This is my friend Jacob, uh, who in the winter uh, completely insulated his back porch because he was really strict about COVID rules. So he wanted to make a, uh, a warm but sort of COVID ventilated space where he could still, where he could see his friends and he was uh, he's still hoping, hoping to open it as a, as a cafe. Um, but yeah, sort of acts of, of creative agency, right? Of, of making do. Um, fifth one is about, is about uh, the neighborhood, how the neighborhood is, is sort of conceived and from the back porch, from, from that you know, view out into the alley and across the alley and around the alleyscape. Um, really uh, latent images of, of Hitchcock's rear window, right? But also just, um, but, but this, sort, this sort of characterization that happens in that movie of characterizing your neighbors, that's, that happens in real life all the time, right? That's how we come to know our neighbors through, you know, um, 
how, how loud they are, how often they vacuum, uh, you know, what their gar when they take their garbage out, when they go on smoke breaks, what's in their garbage. Um, you get to know your neighbors in this kind of weird fragmented way. Um, and there's some, there's some films about that sort of spectacle, right? The spectacle that, that becomes of it where you sort of, it's, it's a theater, right? And uh, the back porch is kind of like a balcony seat, but also kind of like in the theater when those people in the balcony seats are also uh, conspicuous, right? They're part of the show kind of. And so as soon as you step out, you're actor and uh, spectator, right, of this, of this drama. There's some really great films, home movies from the Southside Home Movie Project. Um, of this spectacle, right? But it's but it's a decidedly infrastructural one. It's enclosed. It's working on the home, right? It's it's seeing uh, the city come and cut down trees uh, in in the alley, um, and and it's painting. It's having the back porch painted, right? But but the audience is just as much a part of the show. And I, I think in this shot, even you can see uh, there's a lot of pixels on this page. You can see somebody across the alley peeking out and trying to catch the uh, the commotion. Mm -hmm. I know I'm, I'm getting close. I'm just going to say a couple more things. Oh, I'm almost at 15. Wow. Uh, six is about reform. It's about uh, the middle class sort of saying, what is the back porch? Why do we still have these things around? Uh, why are they falling apart? What are we going to do with them? Uh, so there's three versions, reforming the structure. So reconstructing back porches that happened after this big uh, collapse in 2003. Aesthetic reform, which has always been a thing, but then also enclosing the back porch and sort of disambiguating, it, making it a more sort of cohesive part of the, of the dwelling space. Uh, and then those three sort of acts of reform become a big part, you know, become uh, sort of co-opted by this cohesive movement really of, of uh, urban renewal. Uh, back porch becomes this sort of emblem of, of blight, right? These are Mildred Mead's photos of, of uh, blight around uh, the University of Chicago and back porches are a big part of that. Uh, and so it's this, this it's this ambiguity that at some point the middle class is like we can't deal with that. And so in my conclusion, I bring it forward to the present, looking at the neoliberal city, right? These these neoliberal developments and 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 how they really uh, exemplify a really different relationship to to the street, to the alley, to the city, uh, and to people. Um, this moment says it all to me. Uh, people love to imagine uh, really acrobatic uh, cat burglars or something. But um, in the end, yeah, it's, um, it's a question of, of uh, sorry, to, to summarize what I don't think should be summarized. Um, it's, it's, about, it's about kind of these uh, liminal spaces of, of ambiguity that um, right now we tend to be a little afraid of, especially in, in COVID, right? We're scared of, of public civic space of sort of this unknown, uh, uncontrollable aspect of the city, and we, we sort of we, we we think that this maybe is something we should be we should maybe be building towards, right? Socially distant, strong box architecture, right? But um, I don't know. I'm wondering. You know, my questions are whether I think we can all say, you know, after experiencing this stuff, like there's been something missing, right? It's like being out in the city. You know, having something that ancient sensation of something unexpected happening, right? Of uh, of rubbing elbows with with this with with God forbid strangers, right? Um, we miss that stuff, um, and so yeah, that's all I have. Thank <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Sorry, uh, I went to the no, no, we, we blew through your, your Q&A time, but you, you were in a groove there. So I think it was more valuable to, to get to the end here. Um, so thank you so much. This is, was awesome. Um, I assume there are a bunch of questions, but I'm going to propose that we hold our questions for Sam to the end um, if we have some time there and uh, just get on to the next presentation for now. Um, but yeah, wow, thanks, Sam. Um, thanks for the illustrations as well as the um, stories. Thank you. Okay, up next is one, uh, the, the, the last of our esteemed trio of Sam's, uh, Sam Clark, who will be presenting Ghosts Which Should Exist, Urban and Landscape Disaster in the Greater Chicago Region. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Evan. A moment to share my screen. All right. 
Whenever a shift in our spiritual life occurs, quotes W.G. Zabald of Michael Hamburger, we believe we can remember, but memory fails us. Too many buildings have fallen down, too much rubble has been heaped up, the moraines and deposits are insuperable. When we speak of history, especially those histories which have been conjoined or subsumed into a landscape, be it by erosion, scorching, burial, or flood, it is largely the case that the witnessing which is demanded of the historian is made exponentially more fraught and feeble, and indeed becomes impossible to shift to, to sift through as one might an archive. It is for this reason, perhaps, that with regards to landscapes, which have at their core a kind of proposition of vanishment, such as dunes or ruins, exercise of historical attention resembles a kind of synambulance. The function of this discursive sleepwalking, which does not lose sight of the historian's abhorrence of injustice and violence, is to lift a measure of that paralysis of our moral deductive faculties in, a, in the face of wreckage of the catastrophic joining of natural and human history. Bertolt Brecht once observed that petroleum resists the five act form, thus reckoning with time and history in the Anthropocene indeed asks us to consider which fossils of ours might themselves still be monsters and which forms of rubble may yet rise in new incarnations of obliteration. So perhaps then it matters that the shoreline of Lake Michigan is a terminal moraine created at the point where the glacier which gouged out the Great Lakes paused briefly, depositing the polarized remains of those topographic formations obliterated by glacial advance and retreat. Curiously, this terminal moraine is the location from which one Captain H.R. Brinkerhoff in 1893 spied a serpentine creature of 30 feet long and with a reptilian head rise and then disappear into Lake Michigan. Sea serpents appear in those moments of history which are the despair of historians because they are dull and the joy of peoples because they are happy, wrote a Chicago columnist in 1933. The proposition that certain monstrous creatures appear periodically in moments outside the purview of the despairing historian is an evocative one and suggests in a way a breakdown to successive ages of history, a kind of sedimentation to the historic and geologic record, which enables the monstrous to slip through. If one traces further down southward along this terminal moraine while turning back the clock from 1893 to 1871, as the great fire scorches Chicago, one could observe two minor destructions amid this larger annihilation. The first is a sundial on Michigan Avenue, which was once the centerpiece of the Ian Arnold House's renowned gardens, and which bore the inscription, as many sundials do, I number only the fair hours. The dial, of course, was utterly defaced by the fire. The second minor destruction was the obliteration of the complete skeleton of the Basilosaurus exhibited as the Great Zoiglodon in Colonel Woods's Curiosities Museum. This creature, unearthed in 1845 and changing hands several times before arriving in its final destination of Chicago, was first identified as a prehistoric sea serpent before being properly categorized not as a reptile, but indeed as a fossilized whale. When the whaling industry began to collapse as a result of the discovery of oil at Edward Drake's Pennsylvania Well in 1859, it began the slow transit of the whaling bark progress down from the Arctic Circle to Chicago for display at the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Soon, however, it was not even profitable as a museum piece, and by 1899 the ship was abandoned as a rotting wreck in the mouth of the Calumet River drenched in sewage and industrial runoff. And if you turned away from progress prior to its destruction by dynamite in late 1902, you could in a few hours make your way south to the largest oil refinery in the Midwest, which crouches at the southern edge of Lake Michigan in the city of Whiting, Indiana. Built by Standard Oil in 1889, the refinery, like much of Chicago and its industrial hinterlands, was constructed atop a mosaic of Martian dune systems sculpted by the retreat of the lake water and the glaciers. By the time Henry Chandler Cowles published the first of his seminal treatises on the Indiana Dunes in 1899, what he was studying were the few extant fragments of a wholly annihilated landscape. 
Even so, he identified in his studies the tendency for the sands to bury the past and offer recurrently to plant life a world for conquest. The ephemerality of such conquests, however, allowed cowls to demarcate into separate stages a dune life cycle marked by unmaking and remaking. Embryonic dunes arise, accumulating sand anchored by perennials until these plants come to be buried themselves as the dunes begin to wander, moving on average slowly inland according to age. As one plant community succeeds another, they tend to slowly stabilize the oldest dunes to a theorized point of fixity that Cowles was never himself entirely sure of, in which he refrained from describing in absolute terms. As such, the covenants between sand and flora, which install periodic stability, are never fully beyond the reach of catastrophic unmaking. Notably, the Mount Baldy dune took shape over four millennia after Lake Michigan's gradual lowering unearthed waves of loose sand. While originally likely covered in vegetation, at an indeterminate point in its history, Baldy was shattered by some catastrophic event familiar to dune ecologists as the phenomenon of blowout, which denied a slow succession towards stability and instead left it to wander. A blowout is referred to by an alternate name, the graveyard of the dunes. In such spaces, forests, fields of bones, and relics of vanished societies are buried and unburied seemingly without reason. Such incomplete vanishments suggest an addendum to any gradualist interpretation of dune succession or indeed natural history, alluding to an arc of progress which is not an upward march towards stability, but instead a frantic spiral of natural historical destabilizations marked by the intrusions of the dead and the vanishment of the living. On July 12, 2013, news outlets reported the break off of a Chicago sized fragment of the Pine Island Glacier, the structure stabilizing from breakdown part of the immense West Antarctic ice sheet, whose ultimate destruction will catastrophically raise the seas. A few hours later that same day, a child wandering on Mount Baldy disappeared into the sand. When he was extracted from the gullet of Baldy, unresponsive yet still alive, Examination of the excavation site found a pattern of branching voids without trace of organic material, but nevertheless in an unmissably arboreal shape, suggesting that he had fallen into the negative space of a rotted out trunk of a tree, which had itself been swallowed by Baldy. One must imagine, needless to say, the day passed without remark at the Whiting refinery. I wonder about this moment, one July morning, in which two acts of disappearance for a brief instant, instant intersect, and the haunting suggestion that where two vastly different geophysical time scales crash together, it becomes impossible or indeed probable for one to tumble precipitously into a void in the shape of a hollowed out nature. And perhaps then this is the dispiriting outcome which occurs when apparent dynamics of stabilizing force and su to succession no longer can take shape, as many studies of climate change's effects on ecologies can attest, and instead landscapes come to wither into sites of vanishment and derangement, through which to the despair of the historian, memory finds no purchase and the monstrous finds transit. I will close with an admission of my own partial failure here. I, I have presented fragments which uh, resist coherence. <laughs> Nevertheless, I wonder if this is one of the only kinds of historiography which might successfully puzzle out the monstrous particulars of our individual and societal engagements with natural and human history. As a scholar of art history has said, the condition of witnessing what one did not and indeed perhaps cannot see is the condition of whatever age we are now entering. Fossils, fossil fuels, fossil skeletons, of course, defy witness, being things which we have never seen properly except as shadows, but which nevertheless curse us with bystandership to annihilation. I am uncertain as to whether we might find in ourselves the ability to overcome such an accumulating weight of ruin and wreckage. Thank you.
Thank you, Sam. That was extremely moving um, and unsettling as intended, I think. We have time for questions for Sam. I'll ask a question if uh, nobody else has one. Um, Sam, that was really beautiful. I'm wondering how, what you envision. I know you have some time left for your thesis. So I'm, I'm wondering what you envision as sort of your final product. Is this something that you want to write and publish as a story or are you envisioning some kind of research paper? I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit given what we, I think what we saw was an excerpt of, of that. Sure. Um, as given that I opened with the quote of W.G. Zabalds, and for those of you familiar with his writing, I've clearly borrowed um, as well a kind of voice. Uh, I've thought a great deal about what kind of a historiogra historiographical approaches um, are best able to address subjects like ruin or subjects like vanishment or disappearance, um, which are kind of my principal preoccupations with the Chicago landscape. Um, and I think something which spans both the work of history, but also literary sensibilities is the way that I'm personally envisioning uh, approaching this. And I'm, I've been working on a, a paper that does essentially span those, those two considerations. So if that sheds any light on it. Great, thank you, Sam. I have, a, I have a question, Sam, also. Oh, Allison, Allison, go for it. I had, I had the wrong hands up there. Um, great, great job, uh, Sam. I have a uh, particular, very specific question, um, which is about, so you talked a lot about Coles and his ideas about succession. Um, and I think unlike uh, Clements, who's one of his contemporaries, he didn't focus on this um, climax community as much. And so how do you take into account, and in fact, I think that his theory of ecological succession really takes into account the idea that um, there's going to be um, interruptions, that there are going to be um, uh, d disasters, that there are going to be blowouts, so that all sort of is part of the theory um, and is why it's not linear, right? In, in, a, in a particular direction, it can stop and start again when there's a disturbance. Um, how do you sort of see that fitting into the narrative that you're trying to tell? Right, so ecological, ecological succession was of particular interest uh, for me in conversation with discourses uh, in the late, um, 18th and 19th, uh, early 19th centuries of catastrophism specifically, um, and the ways in which periodic uh, catastrophic events were perceived as uh, sort of the motive force for um, succession in a kind of geophysical way. Uh, naturally, this ha uh, has fallen out of fashion. No one is in the business of citing Cuvier in uh, actual bio, uh, paleobiological um, documents. Uh, that said, I was quite fascinated by this notion of stability as unfolding itself through disaster and the ways in which stability uh, fails to be uh, enforced by disaster and instead disaster starts to concatenate with these large unravelings either of landscapes or societies or uh, in some cases, individuals. I think there's a really powerful resonance specifically in the dunes um, with madness. Um, the dunes uh, in Indiana, specifically um, in the early um, 19th century, uh, being the home for you know, drifters or casts, uh, cast offs, uh, as well as visionaries uh, and poets. So this question of spaces which are either unraveling or allow a kind of nonlinear transit through space uh, as one, as I, I believe I mentioned, the 
fact that one can walk uh, inland uh, in dunes and in the dunes and in that way transit not only space but also time moving backward along the on average the chain of succession uh, was was quite an evocative one for me and had resonances through sort of other ways of biologically or naturalistically understanding time. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, great, great uh, detailed answer there. Um, we will have to leave any further questions for Sam also to the end, to our hypothetical extra time at the end, um, and shift gears now to move on to uh, Javi Gone is the next one on our schedule. Javi is here. There he is. Okay. You ready to go? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let me okay. Uh... Javi just came from a different final. So um, <laughs> uh, he'll be catching his breath, um, but he'll be presenting a spatial analysis of Chicago's Green Alley program. Over to you, Javi. All right, yeah. So let me just uh, go to the right the slideshow button, and I'll start the. Okay, so my presentation is uh, a spatial. I so I chose to do for my thesis a spatial analysis of green alley infrastructure in Chicago. Chicago has uh, urban flooding issues. Climate change is expected to. So Chicago has an urban flooding issue for a couple of different reasons. First off, Chicago was former swampland. It uh, occupied a lot of former marshland that was paved over. And when it was paved over that marshland and that absorbent soil um, was unable to uh, direct it. So typically rainwater would have directed itself into the ground in uh, the Chicago area. But when we paved over most of the city, I think about, um, I'm blanking on the figure as of this moment. When we paved over the city, that rainwater, that rainwater runoff, that rainwater which typically would have gone to the ground, turned into runoff. This created the current um, city's urban flood problem, which manifests in basement flooding, riverine flooding, and shoreline flooding, and is only going to be exacerbated by climate change in the uh, upcoming years. The flood problem is not just um, the flood problem is uh, it's a health issue, it's a uh, economic issue because it causes a lot of uh, a significant number of damages to um, uh, cause significant damages to, to property, to uh, uh, livelihoods, it destroys um, precious items, but is also um, an issue because the predicted flood maps in Chicago, the predicted uh, flood insurance coverage as mandated by FEMA does not cover the current high risk flood areas in, in Chicago. So if you look at this map, right? FEMA covers the majority, this map compares the majority of uh, uh, the, so this map compares the at-risk flood areas um, as, calibrate, as calculated by uh, the first street model at, to the flood areas as, as uh, determined by FEMA's flood zone model. As you can see, there's a, an abundance of flood zone uh, uh, at-risk areas down in the, um, the Calumet River uh, basin uh, by Lake Calumet, but there's not as much up in other more riverine flooding areas that experience significant uh, urban flooding as well, despite not being covered by FEMA. This creates a uh, disproportionate impact to flood insurance, to um, mitigating flood damages. Um, and that impact uh, is not even fully determined by this model here because this model isn't able to take into account is a lot of uh, basement flooding. So a lot of basement flooding occurs as a result of localized factors. And that's gonna be important to remember as we go through the presentation. So uh, that brings us to the fact that this disparate flooding is ultimately an environmental justice issue. When you look at the flood patterns throughout Chicago, and you look at the um, damage rates of urban, of, uh, urban flooding effects uh, based on insurance claims through the city of Chicago, these effects predominantly occur throughout the South and the West side and predominantly uh, communities of color and lower income communities. Um, in contrast with, if you look on the, uh, the map on the right, in predominantly, um, in majority uh, white neighborhoods, you see a drastic decrease in uh, flood damage rate and flood damage rates. This disparity is important because this disparity is important to note because it's reflective of a larger infrastructure disparity in Chicago, as well as it begs a lot of questions when we go into the development of sustainable infrastructure and green alley infrastructure 
um, in response to uh, a lot of these, to, to this urban flood dilemma. So I'll explain that further. Stormwater infrastructure is the main response to uh, the urban flood problem. Um, in the past, that has taken the form of the TARP program, the, the uh, Tunnel and Reservoir Plan, which expands existing tunnels, uh, sewer reservoir, uh, existing reservoirs and sewer tunnels for the Chicago area uh, as a means of um, taking in more rainwater runoff into the sewer system and redirecting it in the events of uh, intensive rains or, um, yeah, basically mainly in the event of intensive rains, it will redirect this water to other parts of the city. This is not sufficient as of right now. As of right now, sewer overflows uh, occur pretty frequently. The numbers are about once a week for the past, for over, about once a week over the a seven year period from I think 2007 to 2014. This, um, this, uh, hold on. Prior to, to, to doing this presentation, they were doing some sort of construction right outside my apartment. And I had the air, the windows open. The whole place got filled with like an acetone kind of thing. So it's super, super dry. Basically, the, the TARP program is not sufficient to, and to resolve the city's uh, urban flood dilemma because one of the big causes of urban flooding is actually infrastructure disparities. So because urban flooding is a unique form of flooding that's distinct from like a lot, that encompasses both riverine and shoreline flooding, but is distinct and encompasses a lot of other different flooding phenomena. Um, flooding tends to be a localized infrastructure, uh, tends, tends to have localized effects and varies locally depending on uh, local infrastructure, ages of buildings, which means that the tunnel and reservoir plan, although it redirects a lot of rain flow, in the event that there are uh, the, the mechanism through which it redirects, redirects this, um, this rain flow is through the sewers. And if the sewers get blocked up in a certain area, that could still, as a result of like heavy rain flow, uh, trees falling over, um, just general clogging, the, that, could still, that could still result in urban flooding effects, which means that disparate levels of precipitation can affect neighborhoods differently. And this is important to plan for, which is why the city has begun investing within uh, green stormwater infrastructure. In 2006, they began this plan to set up green alley infrastructure throughout the city of Chicago, which basically would um, innovate. It was green infrastructure because unlike the gray infrastructure, which direct, which dealt with the runoff and the sewer uh, and the flooding problem through directly targeting uh, the flood source of the of the of just uh, the water overflowing sewers, it instead uh, the green alley infrastructure instead tried to target the source of the problem, which was the pavement that I mentioned earlier. Because Chicago paved over most of its marshland, a lot of that rainwater that typically would have been absorbed into uh, marsh soils um, instead overflows and you know, manifests in the urban flood problem. But what green alleys would do is they would actually install permeable pavements. The permeable pavements, which as you see here, would then redirect uh, water into the ground. And that water in, and that into the ground, um, the water would be either redirected into the ground or into little basins underneath green alleys that could then be evaporated, or uh, uh, which would then mitigate rainwater flooding at the source, um, restoring a lot of Chicago's natural soil ecosystems and um, helping to greenify the city as part of uh, the latest in urban sustainability trends. So the question of the green alley, so, 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 so what this project wanted to do was to look at this development of green alleys, um, this, this, uh, this novel form of green stormwater infrastructure, which integrates uh, the ecological response of the natural Chicago ecosystem with the built environment of, of the city. And we wanted to, uh, I wanted to analyze and assess what was the distribution of this current, what was the, the distribution of all these green alley sites? What did this infrastructure look like as of right now? Where were there gaps in green alleys? Where were there uh, uh, weaknesses? And what would these implications have in terms of uh, the effectiveness of the Green Alley program? And what would it mean uh, as a larger, uh, what would it mean for the larger uh, project of sustainability within the city of Chicago? A lot of authors have noted that some dilemmas with sustainability programs is sustainability for who? Um, frequently, uh, sustainability programs go to benefit uh, middle and upper class communities for, uh, before they uh, before they go to benefit lower class communities. And this disparity is something that needs to be watched out for when developing uh, sustainable infrastructure or infrastructure with response or uh, uh, when developing sustainable infrastructure, because 
It's a question of sustainability for who? And um, perpetuating disparities in, sustain in access to sustainability and access to infrastructure uh, investments leaves us with the same kinds of environmental justice issues that we discussed earlier in terms of the urban flood disparity, probably due to infrastructure uh, disparities in um, aging buildings or uh, less maintenance on sewer systems. In order to do this, we focused on a couple of different estimates for uh, quantifying green alley density. We used the kernel, as, used the kernel density estimate to, to get a general feel for um, the, to get a general feel for the patterns of clustering throughout the city uh, of, uh, the, of, of green alleys. We use the density clustering estimate to analyze um, green alley sites in relation to each other and see, okay, so if there's even a relative amount of uh, density, so the, the kernel density estimate will reveal like relative uh, uh, densities for the city and the clustering will reveal relative density between each one of the, the sites, right? So you can have sites that, theoretically, you could have sites that were in a very dense area for the city, but it wouldn't necessarily indicate clustering unless they were also densely related to each other relative to other green alley sites and their relation to each other, which is what density clustering was going to analyze. We then developed a green alley score in order to quantify uh, the density of green alleys per unit area to allow for comparison with uh, predictor variables, which we thought, which, which I don't know why I keep saying we, I think I'm, I'm used to doing uh, research within like a, a project team. I, I, I wrote this thesis. Um, with help and assistance, but I feel like we, I, I feel like I kept saying we and someone was like, why are you saying that? So um, the green alley score was devised to help better contextualize the uh, density of green alleys with predictor variables that could possibly have explained the distribution of these green alleys. In, predict, in, in correlating these predictor variables and, and, and we, we wanted to do two things. First, we wanted to use the bivariate Moran's eye to assess um, spatial correlation, which is a it's a it's a redundancy analysis method that basically, well, the bivariate Moran's eye basically looks at the spatial correlation, basically looks at the the numerical correlation of two sets of standardized data, and then assesses um, how close they are to each other in space and compares that with like a random a randomized uh, version of that distribution. So like theoretically, if you were to take a uh, distribution and just scatter it throughout the city, you would expect kind of like a randomly even spatial distribution. If you were to then see, if you didn't see that distribution and then you saw a similar distribution in another variable, the bivariate Moran's eye would then um, determine that there was strong statistic, statistically significant spatial correlation of two variables in a certain area, such that why was there a clustering of one variable in the same area as another, if that makes any sense. We don't want hey, 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 Javi, that does make, that's actually a great description, um, but we, we're actually through the, the 10 minutes already, so maybe kind of uh, zoom ahead to your, your findings um, so we can kind of get the, get the meat of, of it um, before having a question or two. For sure. So uh, we basically found that there was significant clustering of uh, green alleys within the urban core and contrast of the urban periphery, and that this uh, density appeared on all clustering uh, kernel density maps, as well as within the uh, green alley score device. We then found that this uh, distribution correlated with both precipitation, uh, inversely correlated with precipitation levels, such that there was higher precipitation levels throughout the urban periphery than there was within the urban core, which was kind of an interesting thing to note, which I'll get to uh, in a minute. And then we noted that there was also a correlation, a uh, localized correlation of um, low green alley density with low per capita income, as well as high green alley density in areas with high per capita income, as you can see within this map. And that was statistically significant up to with a, uh, when measured with um, a p-value of uh, 0.05. This was pretty important because uh, not having green alleys in an area direct, because green alleys and their localized, the localized, um, Local, the, when, where green alleys are located is very important to their functionality. So if you had a green alley in an area, that would directly contribute to uh, mitigating rainwater runoff in that area because of the localized effects of uh, urban flooding would mitigate urban flooding more depending on its location and the density of these locations. Because there was a deficit of green alleys within the periphery, that might have the implications for uh, the, um, that might have implications for the effectiveness of the green alley program in terms of uh, uh, helping out and reaching areas that are in the most significant need of uh, urban flood mitigation or at the largest amount of urban flood risk. 
for the research to definitely be conducted though. Bravo, thank, thank you for getting through that last bit um, so, so quickly. We have time for, for a question or two for Javi, I think. I have a really basic question, Javi. Um, what counts as a green alley? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of different types, but it's basically any site that includes a uh, permeable surface or a surface that redirects uh, rainwater into like a natural source. So one example of like a kind of a non-permeable surface that is still a green alley would be like a, um, a stormwater capture, like a, like a, a French basin, uh, no, a French drain, which is not the same as redirecting the stormwater directly into the ground, but instead redirects it into a pipeline, which then um does not connect to the main sewer system and instead redirects that water into like uh local uh, ponds and marshes which is actually pretty beneficial because a lot of the urban urban flood problem is an environmental hazard because it redirects into the main sewer system and combined with uh sanitation sewage which is killed a lot more um human waste matter which is tends to have a lot more bacteria and uh potentially infectious disease yeah thanks I think we need to go on, um, but bravo, Javi. Our next presenter is Thomas Daniels. Thomas has done a study on implicit bias in Chicago's point in time homeless count, contact anxiety, media representations, and other factors impacting volunteer enumeration. Over to you, Thomas. I know a long title, right? Um, <laughs> best I could get it down to. Okay, so share my screen for my presentation. All right. Can everyone see it? Sweet. And so, hi, my name is Thomas, and today I'll be presenting my findings on implicit bias attitudes and volunteer enumerators for Chicago's point in time homeless count and what that sort of means for. Uh, certain things looking for with the count. So just the quick things we're going to go on. First, we're going to be talking just about like the, the background of what this sort of thesis has come about. So what point in time homeless enumeration is, is it's been used by the Department of Housing and Urban Development since 2005 as a biennial strategy to data strategy to count uh, the number of homeless persons on the street at any given night. A quick little snapshot um continues of care which are just regions federal regions chosen to sort of be homeless air or places for homeless uh homeless resource allocation and shelters just that sort of like whole thing they conduct these counts they can do at least the bare minimum of capturing each homeless individual but can do more uh but it has to fit this definition of homelessness that is can be very like strict at times and obviously it's what the data can be used for other enumeration efforts do exist as well and they can provide different totals because of how they change up their methodology and in comparing it there can, might be some issues in this quantification one concern might be that definition of homelessness that we just talked about where it is very strict on just having people on the street or living in what we consider inhabitable areas not including things such as people doubled up living with other families or in marginal or transient housing also the second thing might be its methodology or the usage of it in terms of like using workforce volunteer workforce who might not be as greatly trained as other shelter workers and might be unfamiliar with interacting with homeless individuals here's an example of just like a study that had issues with chicago's homeless point in time count and you can see the different numbers in that table on the bottom just about how you get different things different numbers based on different ways of counting so on a more sociological level when it comes to homelessness uh it's kind of seen more when in terms of a dichotomy or reflected outside of domicile or people who have housing so it gives it negative contra or associations that might not be true for any given homeless individual now you have recent changes at large see it more positive and more respectful of home people but not really influence their interpersonal engagement and i think that's really key when it comes to these point in time volunteers does the experience of the point in time count shape them in a more positive way do their prior attitudes actually affect their work so 
the basis of the study comes down from a limitation in a study by Schneider et al., uh, Schneider and other authors, which felt that their data was only limited to PIT administrators and in interviews, and it might have some bias in it. They wanted to go more in depth on individuals conducting that count. And they also, I want to examine if the point in time count can be a quality interaction between homeless groups and the volunteers and what this means for attitudes and beliefs. Can it be a positive shift for it? Or is it more neutral? Does it have any effect on their sort of views outside of the count? And so the population we're looking at with this survey was a was defined by 2020 volunteers for the point in time count in Chicago, and that would be compromised to Chicago students and staff, whether current or former, might also include some community members as well who worked with it. Uh, Chicago studies are, uh, was how to inventory of this population, and they were the ones who used, sent out recruitment emails to these people. And so I used a survey instrument hosted on Qualtrics uh, with having four different sections, specifically the ones we're going to be looking at are opinions on homelessness and the point in time count process. Um, this section three opinions on homelessness was based on bias factors that were in an Aberson McBean in two studies, Aberson McBean in 2008 and Hawking and Lawrence in 2000. Section four point in time count process based more on critical literature on point in time enumeration maybe some issues on it or things that might try to improve it. So this survey is also open. I think I said that for one week only. And here's just an example of what these questions might have looked like, uh, both closed and open ended. OK, so first off, before we get to like discussing some key findings, we'll just talk about we received 14 responses to this survey in this allotted time slot. And of that 12 made it to a final analysis. Um, one had to be removed because they had not submitted theirs at the end of the period. The other because they acknowledged they had not done the point in time count. So I don't know why they got their email in the first place. Um, but you had a base of very limited response pool compared to 500 people approximately who had done the count. Uh, we only could hit around 14 so hard for us to do those things I mean especially section two and profile questions had to be ignored because it was hard to do any sort of inference based on certain profiles based on ethnicity race gender from such a low number uh, and there's some quick little stats here on the respondents at large so key findings uh, we can go around it it was interesting that like we had a question where scale one to 10 respondents on average viewed their frequency of interactions as like a four point once around a four and one third of them had answered under two, meaning that interacting with homeless people were not as ubiquitous or as frequent as you might think, despite living in an urban area recently, although that might be due to them thinking of prior engagements if they lived in non urban areas. Uh, a great finding was that like despite being outside of working as a volunteer in a shelter there was very much neutral to negative interactions in terms of equality when it comes to homeless interactions or interacting with homeless individuals. And while sentiment was strong that like it's not homeless individuals fault, it might be structural factors they can't really control and not really trying to label as unattractive, they still felt anxiety in those specific interactions, those interpersonal interactions with homeless individuals. Respondents also noted that um, their perceptions were influenced by certain sources, whether it be news and media, uh, education, as well as friends or family, those close to the common sources of where you get those things. And they were usually negatively placed, um, as well as they described in an open-ended question, the, though the sort of common things were found was a middle-aged man of color, worn out layered clothing, a somewhat disheveled appearance, but no usage of things such as like words like hobo or vagrant and other negative terms, which shows some level of sympathy for these respondents from these respondents. When it comes to point in time training, they did confirm that uh, point in time training lasts one to two hours, which does line up with a study from the National Law Center Homelessness of Child Poverty, uh, which had issues with how short that training was, but they still felt it prepared them for the activity at large. And finally, just there were some difficulties in undertaking the count, mostly from just how few people they interacted with, they thought there might be more. So on a discussion level, oh, before I get to that, actually, um, you could just see like on the left, there is an example of results I got from question 3.5 regarding how they interact with homeless people in certain settings. On the right was a coded breakdown of 
open-ended responses to a question which asks them recall what they learned in training. As you can see there, there are their breakdowns of how I started breaking those sentences down. So two things to sort of point out here. First was this issue of quality versus quantity for interactions. The Hawking and the Lawrence study that I used, the first the Hawking and Lawrence study suggested that you know, repeated well-meaning volunteer actions should improve pro-social communication. And they use that something like a repeated volunteer experience compared to a control group who hadn't had that level of experience. They were more thoughtful, more engaged with homeless people. Now, it seems like the PIT probably doesn't serve that level of like, obviously it's not the quantitative aspect um, because it's only a one-time thing. And even on a quality level, I don't know if it from what I've heard from these respondents, if it properly gives a sort of quality interaction with homeless individuals, maybe it's due to the, the speed of it, the one night only, maybe because of just how data driven it might be, but it doesn't seem as if it's giving them that level of pro-social communication. If they're still feeling anxiety after the count, still having attitudes that might be a bit more neutral and negative for those interactions. The second study from Aberson and Union 2008 had measures such as contact quality, contact quality, attributional, situational bias, and anxiety. And it seems here that overall, there's some things to predict that they still have biases, outgroup biases towards homeless individuals, mostly due to how they ranked their contact quality with homeless persons, how not as frequent their quantity of interactions with homeless individuals might have been, but they still are very much on situational bias, which is interesting because Aberson and Bean believe that situation, believing in situational bias should create less anxiety with interacting with homeless individuals, but anxiety was still expressed throughout these responses. And then finally, when it comes to just looking at the, the point in time count and how what differences there could be done. We saw the, the three main issues I found in their responses were how short a training session was, which again lines up with the National Law Center's uh, study. There, the strict definition because of problems telling certain persons, there were some issues where people felt it was hard to, uh, they were specifically told not to interact with certain people or, or not like record them, even though they might feel they might need help and that has sort of been an issue of how strict we're defining it might not be great for certain people and how few they encounter during the process, meaning that a lot of people are hiding in those margins or hiding away from a visible area. So overall, it means that there might be some good in like altering how we do the point in time count. I still think it could be a positive way to do the homeless data, but there needs to be some level more robust training and some level of including more or less restrictive definitions to include doubled up persons, marginally housed, youth as well, just so there could be a better snapshot of what homelessness is at any given night. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Very well organized presentation, very clear. What questions do people have for Thomas? I have a question that I can't believe I haven't asked you before. Um, have you ever participated in one of these counts um and what was it like actually i have it which is something i kind of am sad about because they do seem like a very engaged part i remember actually being offered to do it or like suggested to do it in my freshman year and i don't know why i didn't take the opportunity to do so um i knew about it uh and then it was actually interesting about uh i think it was Chris Scrabble and Shannon and Morrissey who gave me some good, uh, who talked about it with me. And then that sort of led me into inqu inquiring about this stuff. But no, I haven't done it. I, I, I kind of want to. I know we obviously couldn't do it right now because I was sort of still on the COVID making sure everything was there. But yeah, no, I haven't done it yet. Next time, maybe. I don't have a question. I just I had a, I just had a comment um, for Thomas. This is really interesting, and I, I think it really 
um, is important for us to sort of dive into how we collect data or how data is collected because we we tend to use a lot of data that's provided through the city data portal or through FOIA requests or anything, but really getting into how the data is collected, not just the methodology, but just some of these really important questions of the population and um, some of the uh, potential like um, sensitivity and the, and the obstacles and the bias that is inherent in any type of data collection. So I commend you, Thomas, for, for doing that for your thesis. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. That means a lot. <laughs> and I definitely agree. That's a very important to just sort of understand. I don't, as I, I said at the end of it, I don't think the point in time count is bad in any sort of way. And I hope my thesis didn't sort of push that. I just think there's like, it's interesting to see what volunteers, which are a very interesting workforce at that one night only there and how they might relate to it compared to maybe more trained individuals or people more familiar with the situations. And yeah, but if the end result is it gives data for like, you know, federal resource and funding allocation, then like it probably should be primed to be the best it possibly can be. Chris? Hey there, I hope I'm able to be heard. I'm on my phone, so it's a little bit tricky. I, I think Thomas, to your point, you know, one of the reasons that Chicago Studies always sponsors participation in the count is not so much because of the opportunity to interact with the people who are actually being counted, but because of this really fascinating collaborative structure that arises around it. It's, it's not just the volunteers who are counting, it's the police and the fire department and a number of uh, organizations that work on a daily basis with the population who are sort of being inventoried that night. Uh, and yet each one of those entities also brings a, a set of kind of bureaucratic assumptions and and particular ways of, of really uh, reducing or objectifying or quantifying the population that's being studied. So again, I, I, think, I think a fascinating study in terms of the way that the volunteer part of the population is handled. I think the, the complementary conversation to it or the second phase of the study would be to ask about those collaborating or contextualizing organizations, which frequently are the ones that are doing the training uh, and so on, to, to look at, at how they consider the work that's being done and where they see that fitting into their, their broader engagement with this population, which if you think just about, you know, Featherfist, a Southside organization that works primarily with homeless veterans versus say the Chicago Police Department, that's two very different populations with two very different sets of assumptions that they, they bring to that experience and to that night. Yeah, thanks for the comment, Chris. And I, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, it's, it's interesting to see where a lot of different perspectives come from when it comes to this count and how they can sort of shape it, as you said, like bureaucratically um, and sort of how those interactions will sort of you know, intersect and what sort of comes of that. I remember that it was the Schneider piece that I referenced in my presentation had wanted also in their limitation, another sort of sources like work with those like partnering agencies and study them and like how they might perceive the point in time count. I, I feel that's another piece of like literature further uh, exploration in this, in this, uh, in this field, I think would be really cool to see because once you have that and you have those, and then finally also interact with the homeless people themselves, like ask them about what they think about the point of time count, having those perspectives are going to be critical to understanding how we can sort of refine and perfect the point in time count as it seems to be like the de facto way for, for housing and urban development to understand homelessness in a quick little snapshot like that. So having those perspectives and, you know, doing some level of intersection would be very critical to create a much better form of the count. Thanks, Thomas. Next up, we are going back to uh, transformative infrastructure or hypothetically transformative infrastructure. And we have Brianna Gonzalez, uh, Brianna Morales, sorry, excuse me. I have a Brianna Gonzalez in my current class. Uh, Brianna will be telling us about 
analyzing the effect of the 606. Over to you, Brianna. Hello. Okay, let me share a PDF because my internet is not working too well. Okay, do we all see that? Okay, cool. So my uh, project was on al analyzing the effects of the 606, specifically looking at demographic and economic development changes. So what is the 606? The 606 is an elevated railway running through roughly three miles around the neighborhoods of Wicker Park, Humboldt Park, Logan Square, and Bucktown in Northwest Chicago. First built on the ground, the Chicago Pacific Railroad raised the railroad in the early 1900s as a result of legislation seeking to create a safer environment. The 606 shifted shifted to become more residential and commercial as the 606 was reclaimed by nature. People who ventured up to the 606 discovered beautiful views and open space, leading to plans to convert the old railroad into the 606, an elevated walkway in the early 2000s. The elevated walkway was finished in 2015 and cost around $2 million. The railroad was reopened as the 606, as a place of open space extending above neighborhoods in Northwest Chicago, providing an innovative public space and alternative transportation corridor. So past work research on the 606, um, one of the main studies was done by DePaul Institute of Public of Housing Studies in 2016, and they found that the 606 significantly increased property values within one mile of the trail, particularly in low income neighborhoods. On the western side of the trail, which passes through predominantly Latino and low income neighborhoods, housing prices have increased 48% since construction on the trail began in 2013, and prices in the east portion of the trail have increased by 13.8%. And since the trail opened in late 2015, prices have gone up 4.3%. Conversely, prices in the west portion of the 606 have increased by 9.4% since the trail opened. Similar infrastructure um, projects have been done in New York City. The Highland in New York City is often called as a catalyst of gentrification in West Chelsea. The completion of the Highland coincided with a burst of real estate development in neighborhoods that lay along the track, causing the overall cost of living to skyrocket. As far as economic development, many local shops and grocery stores were replaced by chains, trendy boutiques, and upscale dining in an effort to serve tourists attracted by the Highline. Thus, Although economic analysis are projected that the High Line has created upwards of a billion dollars for the neighboring economy, much of this payout has gone to the hands of new developers and business owners and doing nothing to benefit the displaced community members. Another example is in the Atlanta Beltline in Georgia, which here you see a picture of it. And it's a system of 22 miles of trail circling Atlanta. The path has been followed by new restaurants and food vendors along more urban sections, as well as various art and architecture installations. Several studies have been done on the failure of the Beltline to protect the homes of low-income residents, which the Beltline eventually ran through. Although $7.5 billion was raised to create more than 5,600 affordable housing units along the path, as of 2015, only 785 units have been completed. In addition, a study done by Georgia State University demonstrated that housing prices within a half mile of certain portions of the trail increased in price by 17.9% to 26.6% between 2011 and 2015. So in my project, I'm essentially looking at economic development changes and demographic changes of the 606 on the surrounding neighborhoods of Logan Square, West Town, and Humboldt Park. So for economic development, I'm essentially looking at if this is an example of commercial gentrification. So I'm looking at business permits and business licenses, um, and I conducted a difference and differences approach in Geoda. For demographic change, I... Um, looked mostly at census data and most of the work was done in R where I specifically looked at the white share of the population, the Latino share of the population and medium household income and how that has changed. So as far as my results um, on the right here, you see a table with all of the, um, so my area of interest was one census, was one census track around the 606. So here you see all of the um, data points for all of those census tracks. Um, and I guess for looking first at household income in um, 2017, um, the median household income, in 2014, the median household income was 53,656, and this was um, increased to 58,247 for the city of Chicago for 2019. 
However, but as you can see, um, most many of the census tracts have in, have experienced a change that is much more um, extreme than that. For example, 17 of the 19 census tracts saw an increase in medium household income, and many neighborhoods in London Square, West Town, and Humble Park saw an increase in median household income from 30% to even up to 125%. So, for example, one census tract in Logan Square saw the median household income change from 40,000 to up to 90,000. And similarly, for that same census tract, the Latino share of the population decreased from 67% to 49%. Um, so as you can see, the white share population increased in a majority of the census tracts, while Latino shares has, have decreased. Cool. Okay. Um, as far as economic development, business licenses have had little change around the 606. It hasn't really, uh, the trends haven't really changed. However, for building permits, um, there has been a spike that coincides with the construction of the 606. However, over time, the spike was found to be not, not significant, especially because it like leveled down. Um, the difference in differences analysis revealed that the amount of business license and build, building permits pre and post intervention is not significant at a 95% in confidence interval. And also ANOVA tests also revealed that these results are not significant at a 95% confidence um, interval. So in conclusion, there's little evidence of economic development, um, like extreme economic development change from my analysis. However, it does not mean that the neighborhoods are not changing. Demographics have changed significantly and housing prices have increased significantly. The 606, the Beltline and the Highline are all important examples to keep in mind because residents of every city, no matter where they live, deserve access to affordable green public transit options without losing the neighborhoods they call home. can stop my share. Brava, brava, Brianna. Thank you. Questions for Brianna. Hi there. Can you hear me? Sounds good. Hi, everybody. Hey, Brianna, awesome job on this. Um, really amazing analysis for um, an undergraduate thesis. I'm like, wait, is this a master's student? It's, <laughs> it's really, really good. Um, but just kind of a philosophical question. When the cities, when cities put in big investments for things like the High Line and for things like the 606, um, shouldn't we expect property values to go up? It would be weird if they didn't, right? So what should be the, the policy approach given that? Yeah, of course. I think things to keep in mind is like, um, not to say that like, that's like the paradox, right? It's like not to say that like low income neighborhoods like don't deserve these like big public investments, right? Or like, you know, fancy parks, right? But they also have to, I think, come with a level of like mindfulness that of like who is currently living in there and like what those current um, demographics are, right? Um, so I guess like some examples of policy, which like Atlanta tried is like, um, you know, making sure there's like enough units of affordable housing and like actually going through that or like instituting some sort of, you know, rent cap or I guess like those are like things that come up to me at the top of my head. Yeah, exactly. But I think it might be interesting to study sometime where big public investment has been made and property values don't go up and what the fallout of that is. Like, is that somehow con con considered a good thing or, you know, I don't know, it's just a thought. But thank you for your analysis, that was great. Ray? I think you're muted, Ray, still. First of all, thanks a lot, Brianna, for this. Um, when the North Kenwood Oakland uh, development was going up in the, was being redeveloped in the 90s, <clears throat> Tony Preckwinkel told me that they were going on a different um, theory than was usual in redevelopment, which was build commercial and then people would move there. Now they were going to build housing and then commercial would follow. 
So I'm wondering if uh, if there's any kind of a time lag that accounts for this finding in, in um, uh, near the 606 that might mean that commercial's on its way kind of thing. Yeah, that's actually like something I've thought about a lot too, because I like find it a little surprising that there like hasn't been like this like increasing like significant like amount of um economic like development change and i think that's like a pretty good um like perhaps hypothesis that perhaps it's just like on the way um and also like covid i'm sure has deeply affected like um like not even my, like my findings of course but like how the like development and how the community has changed so yeah i think that has probably definitely one um like possible explanation thank you Yeah, I think also just these, I mean, these green infrastructure investments and, you know, in particular, these, these linear parks, um, you know, you're building on this other work that's been done that is just showing this is, it's this new form of um, community change that does not fit our prior models of gentrification. So I think you know that you don't have answers to these questions right now is like not necessarily a bad thing it just shows that like you're on to something genuinely new that we're in the process of understanding so i think that's exciting other questions for brianna sam yeah i don't know i mean it's not necessarily a question but just based on, on what you were saying, I mean, I think it's important too that it's like, we can recognize that it's it's a pattern, right, of of sort of of, uh, of old railways, right? Um, and I think that's interesting too, the fact that it's like, it's not really in the community, right? It's kind of passing over in a lot of ways. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. But I think I think in terms of like this for something that like um, like you were saying that we don't necessarily we don't necessarily understand this yet. Um, you look at like the old uh, section of the, of the green line that went to the stockyards and stuff. It's like there's um, there's a lot of places where you can see it. Uh, you can see. I mean, it's like I don't know. Uh, it's uh, it's something we can't understand, but it's also something that's like right kind of yeah i think your like point of like in many circumstances is like is not necessarily like the goal is not necessarily for it to be a part of the community like the way this like i like was even motivated for like this whole project i saw a lot of like news articles of like by like, infrastructure like being put into like humble park and pilsen and community members being like oh like we don't want that so then I was like, wait, like that doesn't really make sense. Like, well, why don't you want it? And then like, you know, then you see like that follows like gentrification and all that stuff. Right. Like who's benefiting from being able to bike over this community, right? Yeah, I with the case of the 606, I'm I'm hopeful though, because um, you know, in contrast to the, I've never been to the Beltline, but every time I've been to the High Line, it's you know, it's obviously just, you know, it's a it's a tourist thing. It's a it's sort of an elite thing, but every time I've been to the 606, um, there's these totally like cool subversive sub subcultural things happening there. There's all these kids with their like fixies who are just like hanging out there. And they're, they're definitely local kids, you know, um, who are making it uh, something for themselves that it was clearly never exactly intended to be. So um, I, I, yeah, I'm hopeful that it's, you know, not, on exactly the same model as the High Line. But don't you think, Evan, that some of that was the intention for people to make it what they wanted it to be in their neighborhoods or places? Unlike the High Line, I felt it was a little more, a little less like the High Line in that sense, but I don't, I don't know, because it, it just seemed that way through the whole planning process. But um, I mean, it was fraught with uh, problems too, but I think that uh, it seemed more unintentional about what it was supposed to be. Yeah. 
Yeah, it could be. Yeah. I don't know. Brianna's the expert, so I'm speculating. I just have to note here too, as someone who grew up in Chicago before returning, um, pre-606, there was a really interesting period where um, I think it was called Friends of the 606. There's a whole like very much grassroots group that mm -hmm. created pathways for us to go on uh, to essentially trespass, right? Like yeah. There was a whole trespassing culture that was um, even integrated into like sustainability tours <laughs> that were happening on the north side. So there's, mm -hmm. but again, I think some of the folks attending these kind of um, cross uh, or, or counter um, organizations were also probably different than some of the neighborhoods um, that, yeah, so it, it, it's complicated, but um, it's just a fascinating topic. So, and like I wrote in my comment, Brianna, it's been great to see this progress <laughs> over time. Yeah, we don't have any other presenters, so th this can be, um, we can spend our last few minutes here and sort of like an open-end Q&A mm -hmm. if there's any other questions for the prior presenters for for Sam, Sam, Holly, no. or Thomas. Well, Evan, I think... I think we were supposed to end at 1.30, so I don't know if that's oh, true okay. But um, I, I do want, I, certainly if you have other questions, but I, I wanted, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to thank all of the faculty advisors, um, as well as the students for this amazing work um, throughout the pandemic year. And so Evan, Ray, Marinia, Emily, Allison, who I think is, is gone. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you as well for helping so much and for the students for persevering through every, <laughs> everything to produce this really fantastic work. Um, we're, we're very proud of all of you. And um, yeah, I mean, congratulations to Sam Algus too for, um, Tess, I'm sorry if I'm, uh, this is a spoiler, but I think it was announced publicly that Sam won the Chicago Studies Undergraduate Research Prize. So we just wanna congratulate him for that as well. So. Right. So hopefully we'll see some of you at the Chicago Studies uh, Garden Party. Julie posted the link if you want to register and that'll be at 4.30 today and we can see you actually in real life person. So <laughs> great. Thanks everybody. Great job. Thanks guys. everyone. Thanks Bye. everyone. Great My thesis is entitled, titled Environmental Justice and Digital Space Education and Activism on Instagram. This project um, seeks to answer the questions or seeks to investigate how environmental activists, particularly youth activists, are using Instagram to enable greater participation in the environmental justice movement, as well as how activists are using Instagram to complement other forms of digital and traditional activism. The, the, the grassroots environmental justice movement has been around in the US for, um, for about three decades and has gained a significant increase in attention from academic and policymakers. Similarly, the number of organizations and individuals concerned with environmental justices has increased. In recent years, particularly in the last year, activists have been utilizing um, digital platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to inform, share, educate, and mobilize other individuals to join or support um, environmental justice issues. Although more attention is being given to understanding the effectiveness and usefulness of these new organizing methods, the relative novelty of digital media, specifically social networking sites like Instagram, deserves greater attention. Within any social movement, um, and particularly within the climate or climate justice um, and environmental justice movement, the first step in mobilization is awareness building, which involves emphasizing the importance, relevance, and urgency of climate change and environmental injustices. However, environmental activists face a huge challenge in framing an issue such as climate change, since it both has long-term impacts as well as short-term impacts, which are urgent and complex. In the United States, 
environmental groups historically have been more likely to frame climate change as a health or economic issue or as a pollution problem. They also have the tendency to frame it as catastrophic or irreversible, which has led to new barriers to action um, and to citizen participation as they may feel overwhelmed or um, fearful of climate change and may not feel motivated to participate in the movement. Fortunately, a younger generation of climate activists now seek to critique the existing social and economic system that perpetuates environmental harm and injustice. The environmental justice movement is increasingly focused on the links between climate change and other social justice issues, including gender inequality, systemic racism, and economic inequality. In other words, young climate activists perceive climate change to be the result of a broader system of problems and are seeking to highlight those problems. In action at the federal level in the United States in response to um, climate change has led youth activists to find alternative routes of action. More specifically, digital and social media have now become key spaces for political protests and other innovative forms of activism. Online activism, coupled with in-person organizing, appeared to reach a new peak in 2020 as activists, advocacy groups, and other individuals utilized the Instagram image carousel to share bite-sized squares of information. While existing research is primarily focused on the effectiveness of social media in changing citizens' behaviors and attitudes towards environmental issues, This project seeks to delve deeper into the most recent Instagram trend um, and give more attention to how social media and social networks such as Instagram can support the environmental movement's ability to build coalitions, build connections, um, and share tangible resources and alternative narratives. My research is primarily based on Bedford and Snow's social movement frames, which are diagnostic prognostic and motivational frames. These frames allow one to better understand the intent behind a um, an individual's actions or a social movement organization's um, actions, specifically looking at um, so specifically looking at the posts that they are sharing on Instagram. For my case studies, I chose three Instagram accounts, um, at Climate in Color, at Queer Brown Vegan, and at Intersectional Environmentalist. These three accounts all follow the same Instagram trend of using um, infographic style posts that tend to follow an aesthetic pattern and are intended to be community pages that provide resources and to make climate conversations more accessible. Using Bedford and Snow's uh, analytical frames, I um, recorded the different themes and topics discussed across these three accounts and then compared them with one another as well as doing an analysis of the specific things that they were discussing in order to take note of any trends and to gain a better understanding of how their actions may be supporting other forms of digital um, activism as well as traditional activism such as in-person protests or um, marches. From my research there are three key themes that um, that I chose to highlight. First, um, there was a great emphasis on education online. As I previously mentioned, each of these three accounts focuses on being a resource hub for their followers. Um, In doing so and creating these types of posts, they encourage their followers to share and create engaging um, content that is generally more accessible for more people since it often dwindles down rather complicated topics into um, key points that are easier for more people to understand. These forms of posts complement other forms of activism as they require a lower threshold of participation. In other words, people can share these posts and um, engage with the environmental justice movement, which is important since not all people may feel comfortable um, 
participating in protests or in marches. Um, and as previously mentioned, the environmental movement has often been overwhelming or inaccessible for many people. Another important theme to highlight was imperfect activism. Um, this involves participating in the movement in small ways rather than trying to fulfill um, sort of an idealized role of environmental activism. This once again combats barriers to participation by no longer using fear as a motivation and encouraging people to participate in the environmental just movement um, in whichever way they can possible. Um, and I think this was a really compelling and important um, theme within my research to see how um, people are using Instagram to increase participation and encourage um, more engagement with the environmental justice movement outside of traditional forms of activism. Lastly, the third theme I want to highlight in this presentation is Instagram's ability to expand networks. A lot of these accounts share posts from other creators, particularly creators of color um, and other youth activists, and, uh, and they have also partnered with um, larger environmental NGOs. In doing so, both these activists are building um, their network, helping build the network between grassroots activists, as well as expanding the audiences of these environmental NGOs and making their work more accessible to more people. All of these findings show how in Instagram is supporting other forms of traditional activism, but by providing new ways to participate and engage with the movement. Looking forward at future research, um, I think it is still super important to look at the effectiveness at Instagram in terms of changing people's behaviors, which I was unable to measure for the purposes of this project. And um, lastly, continuing to understand the innovative methods um, that are being created by digital activism, given that um, social media is not going away anytime soon and will likely continue to be utilized by both those in favor of the environmental movement as well as those opposed to it. This project is contributing to that body of research by providing insight as to how Instagram um, complements other forms of activism rather than solely focusing on how it affects people's actions um, in isolation to other forms of activism.